Bonasuda Planning Commissions are televised live on County of Santa Barbara Television, CSPTV, Channel 20 at 9 a.m. in the South Coast, Lompoc, San Ynez Valley, Santa Maria, and Orchid areas. Rebroadcast of Montecito Planning Commission hearings are on Fridays at 5 p.m. on CSPTV, Channel 20. And now for the roll call, Commissioner Gostanker? Here. Commissioner Overall? Here. Commissioner Burroughs? Here. Commissioner Idelson? Here. And Commissioner Phillips? Here. Thank you. Thank you. The agenda status report. Good morning, Director Black. Good morning, um, Mr. Chair, members of the Commission. This morning we have three items on your agenda, two permit items and a workshop to discuss some proposed ordinance amendments. The first permit item, um, which is a continuance of an appeal hearing that uh, you held in, in October, uh, we are recommending that that item be continued. We're not ready to move forward with um, uh, continuation of the discussion that we had last time. We in indicated on the uh, agenda that we thought we would be able to hear this in January, but I believe it's going to be uh, February before we'll be ready. We've got some flood control um, data and analysis to do before we'll really be able to give the uh, Planning Commission a recommendation on uh, where we should go on that appeal. So aside from that, we're ready to move forward with item number two and the workshop um, item number three. Thank you very much. And projection report. Did we just do that? No. 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 Um, go, moving to the projection report, we have uh, the Planning Commission scheduled to meet again next year on the fourth um, Wednesdays of the month. And the first uh, hearing date, January 26th, we have a permit item on as well as a workshop on the telecommunications ordinance amendments. And that's a an issue that your commission was um, uh, desired the department to come back with, the board directed us to come back with some uh, discussion of items that we might be able to change. We've come up with some ideas that we'd like to pass um, by your commission and get your input on before we move forward and, and go through the uh, formal adoption process. So that would be on January 26th. February uh, 23rd, we would expect to bring back the Bagdasarian item um, for your commission's consideration. And then beyond that, I don't have um, any items projected out. I know the Miramar will be coming back to the commission. I'm not sure if that will be in February or March, but it will um, certainly be in the earlier part of the year. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to open up a public comment period. This is for comments as to items not on the agenda today. Sh should you have any comments, any need to address us, please come on up. Seeing none, I close that. Um, planning commissioners informational reports. Commissioners, <coughs> any reports to share with us all? Thank you very much. Uh, let's turn our attention to the minutes of October 27th. I'm looking for a motion to um, approve, so deny, edit, change. I motion to uh, approve and seconded before me. Uh, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? The, uh, the minutes of October 27th are approved. Do I see a light on? Yes. Is that you? No. Sorry. Thought I heard a light. Come on. Um, director's report and Board of Supervisors hearing summary. Good Doctor? morning, Commissioners. It's a pleasure to be here as always, uh, and happy holidays to you all. As you. Since you. Uh, your last meeting <coughs> on October 27th, there have been a number of uh, interesting items. Uh, at the November 2nd uh, hearing, uh, the Maddie's Tavern historic designation was confirmed by the Board of Supervisors. And uh, we uh, heard also the changes to Chapter 14, the grading code, to uh, better reflect the Regional Water Quality Control Board's uh, desires for stormwater uh, control. And we also had uh, our housing element approved by the Board of Supervisors, which was a major uh, success and uh, happened with a whole lot less rancor than I am told it happened with the last time and has now been submitted to the state and we are awaiting their certification uh, and so I'm very very happy about that 
on November 9th, uh, that was the last opportunity that the board had to give us direction on the uh, Coastal Commission's suggested modifications to the Coastal LUDC, uh, which they did, and they, they chose um, uh, during FAR to represent the uh, board at the, at the meeting. Uh, there was a, a couple of um, uh, sort of minor things, a, a, a pre-final map grading permit, a second reading of the Chapter 14 grading <coughs> code, and then a series of uh, set hearings, which, by the way, uh, set the set hearing process is getting a, a lot of scrutiny from uh, uh, CEO Chandra Waller. She's looking for opportunities, uh, which is her nature, to streamline and save money and where um, set hearings are not required by law, we may see those uh, uh, curtailed in the future. We'll see how that goes. Then uh, uh, we went uh, to uh, Noel and Diane and myself and, and uh, Supervisor Farr went to the Coastal Commission hearing on November 18th in Santa Monica. Uh, we, um, we agreed with almost everything uh, that the Coastal Commission was proposing, but there were a series of issues associated with things that we felt should still be exempt and the uh, uh, things uh, 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 such as coastal bluff stairways and large animal keeping and uh, the and some other items uh, which uh, you are probably aware of and the Coastal Commission gave a little bit to us they raised the um, the threshold for a grading permit in the coastal zone from 50 to 100 cubic yards but beyond that, they did not uh, give us uh, the things that we were asking for. They clarified a few things. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, misunderstandings out there. There's still people out there that, uh, in some manner of speaking, feel, for example, that the Coastal Commission has limited the number or prohibited horse keeping in residential lots. And that's not the case. Uh, I just choose that as an example because it's the most recent misconception that I've been made aware of. Uh, Horse keeping in resident, large residential lots is the same as it's always been in terms of what you can have. You just, according to the the uh, mods, you need a uh, a permit now if you want to uh, establish a new use that includes uh, horse keeping. Uh, we will go to we will go to the we it was on the um, agenda for yesterday, but we just continued it because there was not enough time between the Coastal Commission's action and yesterday to really have all the answers to all the questions that we know we are going to be asked. And so the uh, hearing that the board will uh, have to uh, choose to uh, adopt or not, as the case may be, will be January 18th. And that, that, so that is going to be the uh, time that we expect um, the board to act. They have six months following the uh, action of the Coastal Commission but we have a lot of work to do, so uh, we, to get back to, we still have to go back to them, yes or no. And if it's yes, there's a lot of work to do to get them uh, uh, some, some, some uh, uh, materials. And if it's no, there's a lot of work to do as well. So uh, we don't want to delay it any more than uh, January uh, 18th. Any questions about uh, the Coastal Commission? Commissioner Overall and then Commissioner Idelson. I guess um, the one question I have, will you be going back to the board with a recommendation or simply a report? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we will definitely go back with all the options. And uh, we will talk about the pros and the cons of those options. So in that sense, there will be uh, uh, a, a recommendation associated with each option. But whether or not there will be an overall recommendation uh, still remains to be determined. Commissioner Idols. Okay, I think that answers part of my question, but uh, then you may or may not have a position on the, in January to take to them whether you're accepting theirs. Yeah, and, and quite honestly, uh, uh, Commissioner, uh, quite honestly, uh, we will be looking at it from the sort of technical aspect. So there are a lot of uh, political uh, considerations that come to bear that I believe really are the purview of the board and we will not be making a recommendation based upon the political issues. Commissioner Burroughs. Thank you. <coughs> and what is the, for clarification, what is the <coughs> status on the stairways? The status on the stairways is that uh, 
uh, no new stairways, and existing stairways uh, may be structurally repaired up to a cumulative 50 percent, and once that level is reached, they may not be repaired. And structural repairs do not include railings or stair treads, but rather the structural underpinnings of the, uh, of the stairways. Do you mean 50% of one stair stairway or 50% of all the stairways? Uh, Commissioner Burroughs, 50% uh, of each individual stairway. But we can repair half of them? Yes. And mm -hmm. uh, so th that's, uh, oh, yes, unless it is completely destroyed by a uh, large winter storm, in, in which case it can be replaced. Really? Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, moving on, uh, on de de December 7th, we had uh, a series of uh, Williamson Act agricultural contracts. The, um, the, rich, the, the uh, historic designation of the Rich Beach Cabana was considered by the board in Hope Ranch and was rejected. So that historic designation was not confirmed, and uh, so that, that, that took place. Uh, we had a, a consideration and approval of the Chapter 10 uh, building code, which included the, um, uh, the adoption and modifications to the state building code that goes into effect on January 1st. The uh, that was both the green code, uh, which is a, a number of energy, efficiency, uh, energy efficiency type uh, modifications to the code, and the residential code, the most significant portion of which was the fact that all new structures and, um, and modifications to existing structures over a certain size require sprinklers. And uh, also the uh, medical marijuana dispensary moratorium was extended uh, until December 7th of 2011, uh, which gives us the time to come back to the board with uh, options uh, including uh, anything from an outright ban to uh, a, a consideration of what zoning would be appropriate for such uh, 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 use for the dispensaries. Yesterday, December 14th, uh, there, there was um, uh, the RDA made a loan to an, uh, a project in IV, uh, a couple, an ag preserve. Uh, the, uh, we continued the Coastal Commission suggested modifications. Uh, to the 18th of January, and then we also considered the, an ordinance for small wind energy systems, which you considered, and the board did uh, take uh, an action. There, there was uh, the uh, Montecito uh, version, and then there was the rest of the county, and they weren't exactly the same. The uh, rest of the county, uh, the Planning Commission decided that a lower uh, decibel limit at the property line was appropriate, 50. The uh, one that was considered by uh, your commission had 60. There's really not that much difference when you get right down to it between those two levels, but uh, uh, Supervisor Carbajal felt that the, the, the ordinances should be consistent, and so it's 50 everywhere. In addition, they uh, felt that the one acre uh, minimum lot size for such systems was perhaps a little bit um, unrealistic and they didn't want to give people false expectations that they could get these things uh, and then go through the process of a conditional use permit and then end up getting de denied. And so they changed it to a three acre minimum with the idea that after the 1st of January, we can come back and we can loosen up, but we can't make things more restrictive. We, this was our opportunity to be more restrictive than the code that was going, that's going into effect on January 1st. So if they want to go back to two acres or one acre, they can, but they couldn't leave it at one acre and then go to three. In addition, there was some discussion about whether uh, such systems should be allowed in um, urban areas as defined by the, by the census, and uh, we reported to the board that that ordinance has no effect on urban areas. If we wanted to come back with a different ordinance that addressed the issue in urban areas, we could certainly do so. And uh, uh, the other uh, item of interest yesterday was um, the uh, hiring freeze that uh, Supervisor Farr brought to the board. And uh, my, I didn't see the item, uh, but my understanding is, is that they went not for a, a hard freeze, but a soft freeze. So that means that basically hiring will be closely uh, scrutini scrutinized by HR and the CEO's office on a uh, position by position basis. 
and that is um, my report for you today. Thank you. Questions? <clears throat> Actually, I don't have a question. I've got a comment. I think, <clears throat> I think it's relevant to yesterday's meeting. Uh, if memory serves me correctly, I think yesterday was uh, Mr. Centeno's last official board meeting. And uh, certainly for the folks who reside in Montecito, he has been a, uh, a very objective voice over the years and, uh, and I think cooperative and uh, he'll be missed, at least as from the perspective that I carry. And so I've, he's, he's served the, the county very well. Supervisor Centeno is a man of principle, and, and I greatly respect him for that. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Thank you very much. We now move to the uh, standard agenda, and we're passing on standard agenda item number one and proceeding to standard agenda item number two. No? We Mr. Mr. We, uh, Chair, I think we would um, recommend that you make a take a motion to continue the item to February 23rd mm -hmm. so moved motion to continue to the next hearing no February 23rd. February February two hearings and seconded all in favor Aye. opposed it passes very good uh, we now move on to uh, standard agenda item number two uh, miss Moser welcome do you need time to uh, set up are you ready to I'm ready, Mr. Chair. I should turn off my phone. Let's see. Mr. Villalobos, would you read this into the record for us? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the following is a hearing on the request of Steve Fort, <coughs> agent for the owner, Lisa Loviatancano, to consider case number 09TPN3 application filed on August 10, 2009, and to adopt the negative declaration 10 NGD 16 pursuant to the state guidelines for implementation of the California Environmental Quality Act. Thank you very much. Commissioners, uh, ex parte communications or site visits? Any declarations? Commissioner? Yeah. Um, yes, I did when um, when this project was in the formulation by the property owner and um, Suzanne Elledge's office. I did meet on the site. Um, I think maybe six, eight months ago, Laurel. I can't really remember um, um, when um, Suzanne Elledge's office came to um, me, at, uh, at who was then at that time president of the Mountain Drive Community Association and no longer president, but um, just to kind of get a feel as to what the overall community would think about this. And we did walk the site and, you know, have conversations at that time. Very good. Any other uh, site visits? Any other declarations? Commissioner? Yeah, I also should say that I did um, speak with a neighbor this week, uh, Mr. Brill, who is um, the neighbor that's referred to in um, Mr. Weston's letter, and then I had a call from Mr. Weston yesterday. Thank you. Commissioner Overall. I have previously visited the site, and I also received a call from Mr. Weston. Commissioner Idelson. And Commissioner Burroughs. Very good. All right, let's proceed, and it will be to staff to present. Good morning, Ms. Moser. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Um, today I will be presenting the Loyakano lot split project. The property is located at 1050 Coyote Road in the Mountain Drive community area on property zone 3E1. The existing site is 8.3 acres in size. The property previously contained a guest house and residence. Those structures were destroyed in the 2008 T fire. Subsequently, a T fire rebuild permit was issued for the residence, for residence, garage, and guest house under case number 09 LUP 87. Under that permit, um, installation of foundation elements and grading for the building pad and driveway were completed. That permit was then withdrawn and superseded by case number 10 LUP 113. Development on site is uh, currently underway under that permit, and um, it's my understanding that the residence is pretty far along. 
The currently proposed project is for a lot split to split the property into one parcel of 5.3 acres in size and one parcel of 3.0 acres in size. Development on parcel one would be restricted to a 2.4 acre development envelope and development on parcel two would be restricted to a 0.62 acre development envelope. The development envelope on parcel one was designed to encompass the development already approved on the property. So all of that development I was discussing previously under those land use permits would fit under that within that development envelope on parcel one. Finally, an access easement would be recorded over parcel two in favor of parcel one for access purposes. A negative declaration was prepared for the project. There were four impact areas where impacts were found to be less than significant with mitigation. Those areas were um, aesthetics due to visibility, the potential for the site to be developed with incompatible structures open to public view, glare and night lighting, and vegetation removal. In the area of biological resources due to impacts to Santa Barbara honeysuckle, a sensitive native plant, impacts to trees, um, and the potential disturbance of nesting raptors. In the area of fire protection due to future construction of a residence in high fire hazard area and the potential for unmaintained vegetative fuels and in the area of geologic processes due to the potential for substantial grading and construction on slopes exceeding 20%. Mitigations used to ensure less than significant impacts in the area of aesthetics include mandis mandatory Montecito Board of Architectural Review, use of natural colors and materials, mandatory conformance to the hillside and ridgeline guidelines, hooded and low glare lighting, and landscape revegetation and screening. Mitigations used to reduce um, less than significant impacts in the area of biological resources include honeysuckle replacement plantings, preparation of a tree protection plan, an on-site arborist during any grading and construction activities with the potential to impact trees, and a raptor pre-construction um, pre survey and imp imposition of a buffer uh, from trees should nests be found. Mitigation measures used to ensure less than significant impacts in the area of fire protection include preparation of a fuel management plan, and use of fire resistant construction materials. It's also important to note that um, future development of the site would be required to comply with standard Montecito Fire District conditions and they did issue a condition letter on this project. Mitigations used to ensure less than significant impacts in the area of geologic processes include development <coughs> envelopes designed to reduce development on steep slopes and grading limitations requiring balanced cut and fill mandatory compliance with the hillside and ridge lane guidelines, and limitations on cut and fill slopes. The project is located in the 3E1 zone, and the purpose of this zone is to protect the residential characteristics of an area and to promote an environment suitable for family life. The minimum parcel size is three acres. The project is consistent with this requirement because the property would continue to be used for residential use and following the lot split, both parcels would be consistent with minimum parcel size requirements. Montecito Community Plan Policy Bio M1.23 requires that sensitive native plants be preserved to the maximum extent feasible. The project is consistent with this requirement because any, any Santa Barbara honeysuckle removed during development would be replaced at a ratio of 91, and as a part of the vegetation management plan, uh, priority would be given to preserving individual specimens of honeysuckle. Montecito Community Plan Policy Bio M1.17 requires that oak trees be preserved to the maximum extent feasible. The project is consistent with this requirement because it has been conditioned to require preparation of tree protection plan and as stated before an arborist would be on site during any activities with the potential to impact trees. Montecito Community Plan Policy FM 2.1 requires cooperation with the Montecito Fire Protection District. The project is consistent with this requirement because we coordinated with the fire district uh, during all stages of this project. Uh, we have a condition letter from them and we have also conditioned the project to require preparation of a specific vegetation management plan. 
Uh, Montecito Community Plan Policy GOM 1.2 requires minimization of grading to prevent scars and to minimize erosion and other safety risks. This project is consistent with the requirement because development would be confined to development envelopes and as stated before, limitations have been applied that would require balanced grading and would limit cut and fill slopes. Because proposed parcel two would create a new lot, a points allocation under the Montecito Growth Management Ordinance is required. The project would qualify for a total of 75 points under five different allocation areas. 20 points would be awarded because the project does not direct traffic to specifically identified impacted roadways. 20 points would be awarded under fire protection because the site is less than three miles from the nearest fire station. The response time to, that, to the parcel is within five minutes and the property is served by an approved water supply. Five points would be awarded because the project is below a hydraulic grade line established based upon water pressure. Um, essentially, there's a point um, that our um, Long Range Planning Division uh, worked with the water district to establish above that point, water would need to be pumped to residents and below that point, it would be allowed to um, serve the residences by gravity flow. It's below that line, which is why we um, awarded those points. 20 points would be awarded because the project site contains no mapped er areas mapped on the Montecito Biological Habitat map. And finally, 10 points would be awarded because the site is not within a flood, flood plain. In summary, the project is consistent with the policies of the comprehensive plan, including the Montecito Community Plan, compliant with the Montecito Land Use and Development Code, and impacts would be mitigated to a less than significant level. It's staff's recommendation that your commission make the required findings for the project, including CEQA findings, adopt the negative declaration, and adopt the mitigating mitigation monitoring program, <coughs> adopt the allocation of 75 points for pro proposed parcel two on the Montecito Growth Management Ordinance, and approve the project subject to conditions. Uh, finally, I would like to draw your attention to a letter dated December 13th, 2010 from the um, Environmental Health Services Department. Um, it's staff's recommendation that the conditions of approval be amended to include the requirements of this letter. Um, I've also prepared um, some responses to Mr. Weston's letter if you have any questions regarding that. That will conclude my presentation. Questions or comments? Mr. Obar? Yeah. yeah. We'll wait. Mosher, thank you very much. Um, the applicant. Good Should morning. I the mouse, David. Good morning, Chair Phillips and uh, commissioners. Thank you for the time today. I'm gonna. I think I need to grab the mouse to flip through some slides here. Yeah. Again, thank you for your time today. My name is Steve Fort. I'm with Suzanne Elledge Planning and Permitting. And uh, with me today is the applicant, Lisa Lowiakano, Loiac and uh, Laurel Perez, also from uh, Suzanne Elledge Planning and Permitting. Um, I just want to hit on a, a few points um, to kind of enhance uh, Ms. Mayshore's uh, presentation. Uh, this is the uh, the map um, with the, uh, the the property boundaries, the proposed property boundaries in blue and the uh, proposed development envelopes in pink. Proposed parcel one on the right is the, uh, the T-Fire rebuild area. Again, 5.3 acres. The driveway uh, has been approved to that, um, uh, to that building site. And uh, as part of this map project, we have uh, proposed and added a development envelope on uh, proposed parcel one outlined in pink. Proposed parcel two, the new lot, uh, three acres. Uh, conforms to the minimum uh, lot size in the area. Uh, it's a 0.62 acre development envelope. Again, I just want to emphasize that the development envelope is, uh, uh, does contain all slopes of less than uh, 20%, and uh, access would be taken uh, when uh, uh, structures would be proposed in the future from the, uh, the driveway that has been uh, approved. Uh, and reviewed by Public Works in the Fire Protection District and uh, is actually kind of rough graded in place right now. You probably saw it when you were on site. 
Uh, I did want to show it. Uh, f it sounds like most folks went by the site, but uh, uh, this uh, does show the location of the uh, development envelope on the site on the proposed parcel. Um, uh, Ms. Mayshore's uh, staff report and her presentation today talked about uh, policy compliance and mitigation measures. We did prepare an arborist report that came up with the uh, tree protection plan and a biological survey that uh, discusses uh, uh, honeysuckle restoration if, if necessary. There is some honeysuckle that's tucked under uh, these uh, existing oak trees off to the uh, west of the development envelope. And we did conduct an archaeological survey that didn't find any uh, cultural resources. And again, uh, we did uh, do a fair amount of due diligence with Ms. Mayshore during the process uh, since August 2009. Um, uh, certainly in this area, uh, view protection from public view areas is an important matter. And I just wanted to point out the, uh, the difference in topography uh, from Coyote Road to approximately the center of the proposed development envelope is about 34 feet. Uh, so we feel pretty strongly that in the future, uh, when uh, structures are proposed, uh, they will be tucked in uh, below the, the, uh, the approved driveway and below Coyote Road so as not to impact those uh, public views. And as Ms. Mayshore pointed out, future structures will be uh, required to go to MBAR will likely uh, have to go through the uh, story pole review process. Uh, there is a 16-foot height limit in this area, and of course all the uh, hillside guideline and development standards related to grading and uh, height of retaining wall would apply to uh, future structures. I just wanted to show uh, some views. Uh, this top left view, looking south from Coyote Road over the proposed parcel, you can see how uh, the area of the development envelope and the, uh, the proposed parcel are really tucked down below uh, Coyote Road and you can, you can really look right over it. You can see the tops of some oak trees that run along the, uh, the east side of the property. And I showed some views, um, one looking north from Coyote Road at the, uh, the uh, adjacent neighboring properties across Coyote Road and how they're, they're even elevated further on the other side of Coyote Road. Here's a view looking north from the approved driveway uh, you can see how elevated uh, and, and how the natural topography um, uh, uh, blocks their view of any uh, structures that would be proposed on the, uh, the new lot. And then just another view looking north from the center of the development envelope. You can see how the existing topography plays into uh, uh, the, the, uh, the views of the area. Uh, certainly fire protection, also another important matter. Um, the uh, Fire Protection District has reviewed the rebuild, the map, the driveway. They've determined that there's adequate water pressure, fire hydrants in the area, response time and access is uh, adequate. And uh, uh, when uh, development is proposed in the future, they would also review uh, fuel management, landscape, and irrigation plans as well. Uh, just to refer to uh, Mr. Weston's letter that was submitted last night, there was some comment about a potential for a trail uh, existing on the property which the applicant knows nothing about um, and we, we looked at uh, some trail foundation uh, 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 informational material here and uh, it does indicate there is a trail in the area but it is a road right-of-way trail that follows the existing uh, path of Coyote Road uh, uh, through the area so nothing we're aware of nothing that the County Parks Department is aware of in terms of trails either. And uh, just to comment briefly on the letter that was submitted last night by uh, Mr. Weston. Um, in terms of walls, uh, any, uh, the hillside guidelines uh, require that walls be less than eight feet. In terms of gates and walls and the setback, um, if uh, gates and walls are, meet certain height requirements, I think it's six feet for a gate eight feet for a gate post a conditional use permit is actually required adding a little more level of review and scrutiny by MBAR and by staff in the future um, in terms of the development envelope uh, I, I just don't believe that this development envelope of 0.62 acres is uh, uh, unreasonably large I think it accommodates uh, and may not even accommodate uh, a, a structure that would uh, conform to the, uh, the requirements in the hillside guidelines for a three-acre uh, uh, three lot. Um, 
and I touched on the uh, the trail issue, and I wanted to also touch on the matter of uh, the request for the continuance and I would re respectfully ask that you not continue the project today. Uh, the applicant's been in the process since uh, August 2009. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the neighbors who uh, Mr. Weston submitted the letter on behalf of actually did comment during the, uh, the mitigated negative declaration comment period via another agent and uh, submitted a letter that's in your packet today I believe. So they have had time to, uh, to uh, uh, comment. The comments have been addressed. And actually their comment letter that was submitted doesn't even bring up any of the issues that were bring brought up in the letter last night. So we would respectfully ask that um, uh, you wouldn't continue the project. Uh, we feel like um, there's been plenty of time for comment. Comments were submitted, they've been addressed. The Montecito Trails Foundation didn't decline to comment during the uh, the mitigated ne negative declaration comment period. And again, we would uh, respectfully ask that you follow staff's approval uh, or recommendation for approval today. Again, we th the site has uh, adequate safe access. It's suitable for the approved rebuild and a future residence. Um, conditions of approval include appropriate mitigation measures. And, um, and I won't repeat what Ms. Mayshore and I have already talked about. Uh, so thank her for your time today, and uh, if possible, I would like a little time to uh, respond to public comment if necessary. Sure. Thank you. And I'm available for your questions also. Are there questions? <clears throat> thank you. Let me uh, open this up to public comment. Um, do we need Mr. Weston's letter in the record, or does it go in because it's, is that one page or is it two? M Mr. Chair, that letter would need to be voted into the record. If Do you if want your that now, because like. we're referring to it. Um, That's fine. If you'd like to take that up now. So we have a motion to. Uh, and seconded. <coughs> All in favor? Aye. Very good. That's in. And uh, let's open this up to public comment. Um, we have four speakers. If we can keep it relevant and short, I would appreciate it. And the first speaker is Mr. Venable, uh, representing the Montecito Trails Foundation. <coughs> Good morning, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairperson, and <coughs> also the commissioners as well as staff. My name is John Venable. I live at 650 Tabor Lane, and I'm here to address the trail issue, which was brought to me on Sunday of last week, my first visit. Um, <clears throat> just a little brief history about some types of trails we're looking at here, if we are. Um, in fact, if you could use your county aerial, I would really appreciate that. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, in the history of the Trails Foundation, we have found over the years since 1964 that many times <coughs> trails are uh, handshake type trails where people are allowed to walk across private property. And sometimes it is um, open space where the trails have been used in the neighborhood. And when these trails were first looked at in the 60s to have them conditioned as a either a dedication and then following with an easement on that property and then a, a, a recordation to the county, that many trails that were given were never recorded by the County Parks and Recreation. We have pr pr trails all over the, the, our area, which over the last 20 years, we have gone back to the residents and have had them rededicate the trails and they were then recorded uh, by the county. In this case, uh, while it was a surprise to me, you know, looking at my own, our own map, I appreciate you uh, pointing this out, that it probably is indicated as a road shoulder trail along Coyote, which is not uncommon, and that would connect out to Parma Park. Um, the trail in question would be following the Arroyo down from Coyote towards the uh, Sycamore Canyon. I had an opportunity to spend about an hour and a half trying to hike the trail. It's heavily brushed, it needs brushing badly due to the uh, growth after the fire. So it was difficult to see actually a footpath 
or a trail location. But this map sort of shows that there appears to be outside of the, to the west of the red line, some form of a line or brushing that ha occurred. And then inside the red line, along where the use of the fence posts are, which is not uncommon for a trail to follow the property fence lines. Ms. Moser, is there any way we can see that a little more clearly? Do you have a pointer over there? There's one, yeah. Oh, thank you, Dan. Okay. The first one I was referring to, if I can hit it, is about right in here. And the second would be approximately right here, following the fence line all the way through down there. Now, w what causes these trails is, and I wrote down some addresses, um, 732 to 744 Coyote Road is a long road off of Coyote that extends all the way into the Arroyos. And a lot of times, residents will drop down the canyon and pick up a trail that follows the Arroyo up to a mountain, mountain drive and then go either east or west. And that's why I suspect this could possibly have been used that way. The other was um, Coyote Circle, which also has a gathering of homes that it uh, could appear that that was how that trail was used was from those homeowners. And maybe somebody coming up from Sycamore Canyon uh, because back in the 70s there were a lot of animals in that area. So my question, uh, my request to you is that if we could have some time to study this, to find out if this trail has merit or does not have merit, because um, I just recently picked this up this morning, so it would give me a lot more time to study this. So I do res re due respect, I request that there be some form of time allotted for us to see if there is any public interest on this trail and has there been past history. Thank you. Mr. Venable, before you go, um, how typical is this in your experience? And I'm concerned that someone buys a parcel and there's no designated trail and then you go wandering around and there it is, you know. I, I'm, not, I'm not discrediting your analysis. I just wonder how often you run into this. Quite frequently. You do? Yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, I can give you some citations that we have taken years to resolve. One is a property that is in uh, Summerlin which is the um, uh, Bella Vista Ranch. And that, tr that was all community trails and it took years to have them dedicated because of there was former owners. Finally, the uh, present owner did go through a dedication through Summerlin's uh, Planning co co um, Association. That trail took 15 years to have it on the maps and approved. So that's one issue. Uh, another issue is, of course, the Franklin Trail Another is Padaro Lane. There's many issues that go on continually. Another area is where the trail has been dedicated and recorded, but it's right in the middle of the footprint of the build out. Mm -hmm. So we have been uh, very easy to work with. We will re remove the, the uh, relocate the trails with the property's uh, owner's request. And that's happened several times in the similar, similar area. So it's, it's not unusual for this to happen at all. Mr. Venable, I can see the, the trail line from here. Um, is that necessarily made by people, or could this be, um, could this there have been dogs on the property liking to run up and down there? Probably both, but it seems like the swath that you're looking at is a little larger than animal tracking. Mm -hmm. So um, normally when you have foot traffic, the trail is about 36 inches in tread and 10 feet in dedication. When you have an animal, the tracking goes could go as high as 40 inches on your your uh, uh, actual foot. Tra I'm sorry, your actual traffic flow. Uh, we brush sometimes uh, a minimum of 36 inches, and if it's in a highly used area, we'll go to uh, up to five feet because the growth will grow back in within a year or a year and a half. And by brushing it five to seven feet we can extend the brushing to maybe three to four years. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Overall, I believe, is next. I can get to you. Uh, Mr. Venable, I, the um, question I have, the implication of your request for a chance to study this would be that we would end up 
if we complied with that continuing this so I'm I'm trying to get a picture of what the implication is if uh, if we were to grant this lot split and the applicant were to agree that if you were to find this to be a, uh, a trail and they were to agree that they would upon such a finding grant an easement uh, would that allow us to, I guess this is not so much a question for you as it is a question for staff would that allow us to go forward with this or do we have to continue it Mr. Chair Commissioner overall um, maybe I can give you a couple pieces of information first we did um, consult with Claude Garcia Soleil from our parks department and ask him if there were any trails on this property that he was interested in acquiring for the county and, and he indicated that there, there were none that he was interested in acquiring. We also checked a number of county trails maps, the Montecito Foundation trails map and other um, public maps and found no trail in this area. So um, on the county side, there was an interest ex expressed specifically from parks to acquire this trail. Um, on the other hand, I would think that um, if the applicant chose to um, voluntarily want to dedicate this trail through coordination with the Trails Foundation, that would be something that they could do after this process and not as a part of um, a county applied condition. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Burroughs. So that I understand, so this body could not uh, condition uh, our approval on the applicant working with the Trails Foundation? No, I wouldn't think. It's not a trail. Mr. Chair and Commissioner Bur Burroughs, um, <coughs> we haven't had a lot of time to study this issue, but based upon what I understand of it today, I don't believe that the county has a basis for requiring acquisition of a trail on this property. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for uh, Mr. Venerable or staff? Commissioner? Nope. Very good. Mr. Venable, thank you very much for your thank testimony. You. Have a happy, happy holidays. Thank you. The next speaker is Michelle Whew, Humboldt. Humboldt. Excuse my attire. We're pouring concrete at my house today, and I need to get back soon. Um, I am the proper property to the west of the proposed lot split, the smaller portion. And I have, if you look up in the upper right corner of the diagram where there's a little triangle you'll see a driveway in that triangle that is access to my driveway and the easement that goes to the four properties below me right there thank you for pointing mm -hmm. um, I have not heard any reference to that easement when the property sold um, after Kit Tremaine's death we formally recorded an easement because my mouth of my driveway is completely on that property because of the topography, you can't get out on Coyote Road safely. Um, my house was built in 1953. There was no other house on the mountain at that time. And at the time of the lot split, a uh, real estate attorney looked into it and said I had a right of passage because it had been used for so long and established and there was no other easy way to do that. And I've not heard any mention of that. I'm not sure the owners are aware it was my understanding that easement was recorded in the deed uh, an attorney mark uh, kip tremaine's grandson and an attorney and a notary came to my home and we signed all the documents they have burned in the fire because i lost my house too but i'm concerned about that the easement gives me access to my home and it gives my neighbors below me access and mm -hmm. i'm in the city so that's the city county line right there mm -hmm. um, so i have a little concern over that um, it's, uh, we will repave it. It was damaged and has been damaged by construction trucks even more. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it is technically, there's an easement that runs all the way down that red line to the bottom where Coyote Road is, and there's four properties along there. And all of us have an easement to each other's properties that exits on the top, and the exit on the bottom has never really been established, although it exists as easements on our deeds. I'm going to try to get you an answer to your question right now. Okay. Ms. Mosier, does the existence of an easement affect any of our decisions regarding lot splits? Mr. Chair, the, the, the proposed map shows this easement and it would continue to exist following the lot split. Mm -hmm. 
So it's recognized in mm -hmm. place, and uh, our action today would not affect that. That's correct. My neighbors and I thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming. Um, I also can clarify the trail issue, I think. Good. I've lived there for 26 years, and I had a horse for 10 of those years, and I rode that trail. Yes. And the trail used to be a very frequent, daily used horse trail. Um, there were people who came from below, down lower on Coyote Road who had horses. Um, Dave Harlan's daughter rode daily almost. Um, I rode daily at one point, and some other people farther down Coyote and across the road rode. And what everyone did is they rode up the horse trail. Kit Tremaine had set it aside. Her fence, the fence on that property today, is set back in about 40 feet from the property line. There's a creek that flows only in the winter when there's rain there. And there was in that trail? Yeah, right That's by what that I thought. trail. Yeah. And that creek goes on down to Sycamore. So it's a very, it, gets, it flows quite a bit of water in the winter. And so the path that you see that's kind of ragged, it is actually was a trail. You rode it on horseback. And Kit had a, a landscape person who trimmed the trees up all the time so you could get under them. Uh, about five years ago, my neighbor and I cleared the path. We went in and lifted all the trees so that you could walk and ride there. It had since overgrown again. Um, and it, it was a way to get to Parma Park if you had a horse. And you rode up the trail, up to Mountain Drive, and across to Parma Park. I sometimes rode down the trail, across Coyote into a drive, and went through a friend's property to Parma Park. So it could work both ways, actually. Um, it also was used by kids hiking. Kids and dogs and stuff went up and down the trail real frequently. Uh, it was a favorite place for my son. There was a little meadow place down there. Um, so it has been used in, I would say, the last four years, not hardly at all. It's overgrown again. The fires and the things, you know, it was overgrown before the fire. Um, and so it wasn't being used. But originally it was used a lot. Uh, it was my understanding when they came to get the easement paperwork with me for the easement that is in there, there was also concern about that horse trail. And th they discussed with me the horse trail because there were some liability issues and the potential buyers were concerned about their liability in a trail. And they were trying to sort that out because of somebody owning property and people having access. And it was my understanding that they had sorted that out, that that was sort of going to be left as a trail, but it wouldn't, there wouldn't be any liability issues. And that was just in a discussion. I have no paperwork from that. But it was discussed at the time um, as kind of a story along with my easement, I guess you'd say. Um, so I don't know. I think it would be used again if it were cleared. Um, it, that property was not cleared and maintained uh, real well in recent years. Um, there used to be a gate on the bottom of the trail um, that opened and closed. And at one point, someone locked the gate and was required to open it back up because it was a trail, quote unquote. Um, so that's what I know about the trail. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. The um, next speaker is Karen Brill. You may go. And that would be Peter Brill. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak. And uh, I want to especially thank Nicole, who's been very helpful on your staff. Uh, just a short history of the, of the property. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah, okay. Uh, the owners held a meeting with the neighborhood when they were asked for approval of the first set of plans. And during that time, they indicated there would be no change to the plan. So none of us uh, investigated. Uh, we, we first discovered that there was something different when this uh, driveway was put in place. Um, uh, I must admit at the time, and I have a concern that with the driveway because it's in a dangerous location and uh, evidently not documented by the county, but also there's, it obstructs a public view, which I'll show you, if there's any wall built there at all or any fence built there at all. Um, I must admit initially I was angry uh, about what had happened, but that's not why I'm here today. I'm here today simply to express what I believe are legitimate concerns and for us to get it right. 
And uh, we have one chance to do that because once a lot split, the, the situation changes markedly. Um, I think it's very important that we look at this split carefully because uh, the applicants, uh, obviously, when they bought the area, were in a long discussion. There were legal documents that were signed relative to this trail, and they didn't, uh, didn't ex uh, disclose it. So uh, I think we have to just take a good look at what's happening. There's a picture I'd like to show you, if we could put it up there. Unfortunately, I can't hope you got a clear one because I ran out of ink. Okay. On this picture, you know, my printer, on this so it's not very good, but I hope, could I get a pointer or something or a way to point? Oh, okay. Just press the, okay. If you look here, this is a view from the road. Uh, looking down this canyon, this is the height of, this is six feet. This is the height of a, a little thing, a temporary thing they have up to bring power down to do the construction. That's six feet. I'm six feet, so I took this at the same height that that is. A person five feet uh, would have the same view with a five-foot wall, or a person sitting in the car would have the same view with a four-foot wall. So this is the height that a wall would go across here and basically obliterate the entire view uh, from the public road. Uh, also, the building envelope, which they've done a beautiful job of showing you where it is, but the building envelope is right down in this area here. So depending on the height of it and the size of it, and it can be, I understand, up to 20 feet high, it will have potentially a very significant view, uh, impact on that view from the road and also will have a very significant impact if the trail is authorized on the trail. So uh, I, I just, what we would, so therefore, we'd like the, the conditions, some conditions on this split, because once it's split, we can't get certain of those. Because of the, this is really the initial property in part, we would like to have no gates or walls up in this area, but push them back to where the lot split, to where the driveway splits, or far enough down so they don't affect this view from the road. We'd also like to have a sight line study prepared by the, by the uh, applicants so that we can determine with the, the size of the footprint that they have how much of this will be obstructed by the building. It's a very large, I, I disagree, uh, evidently it's a 20, the accommodates 25 or 30,000 foot prop, you know, building the size that the, the thing is. So uh, that's what I've heard. I don't know if I'm not an expert in this. Um, so I, clearly, that size building would not be appropriate. And um, anyway, it can be 20 feet high because of the way the rules work with the, with the ceilings. And I, you, we don't know how much of this will be taken away. Uh, we'd like to continue this to a future date because of the impact of the proposed building envelope can't be determined at this time on the trail. So we'd like to have time to research the trail and what the impact will be on this sight line, on the trail, and so forth. We received, uh, I disagree, I, I did hire some, a planner before we went away on vacation for a month. All she looked into, from my perspective, was the fire threat here of that road. Uh, I got back from the vacation very soon after that. We heard about the, uh, the hearing. I had a week to talk to the neighbors, find an attorney, uh, try to talk to John at the Montecito Trails, uh, and do all the other things to prepare for today. We have never come in and asked for a continuance before. We have never been heard from before. These issues have never been raised before. Uh, so I humbly ask, that, and my lawyer couldn't be here today because he has to be at another hearing. And he is familiar with all the rules and regs and so forth. So I feel in fairness to our ability to deal with some of these issues, a uh, short continuance is a reasonable request. Um, and uh, finally, I'd just like to, I'm glad you noticed the letter from our attorney and I hope you read it. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Mrs. Brill. Good morning. Really, 
the reason that I'm here is just to protect the public view. We just want to make sure that <coughs> whenever the, um, that we get to see some story polls and get a chance to view what the proposed building is going to look like before it actually goes forward so that if there's a chance for modification in a way that would be reasonable that we get a chance to do that. It's, it's a beautiful public view. It's been there for years. I would hate to see it destroyed by a building that goes very tall and also want to protect the, um, the street view from huge walls. Uh, many times neighbors just offset it a little bit. It's down the hill a little bit. It can still protect the property. I think there's a way for the people who are building and the people who already live there to have a happy solution. So that, that's just what I wanted to say. And also the horse trail was something that we were informed about when we first moved there by the residents of that property. That's how we know about it. And it, I feel like it's always in the interest to protect uh, public walking and horse trails in the area from further development. So if there's a way that that could be continued as had been done before, um, I think that would be a better solution than destroying that option for the hikers and the walkers. So that's really, I'm just underlining what's already been said. And thank you for your time. Thank you. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> seeing no other speaker slips, I will close the public comment period and um, the uh, commission is in deliberation. Mr. Chair, I think you um, indicated that you would give the uh, applicant's representative a bit of time at the end of Absolutely. Comment. Come on up. <coughs> again, Steve Fort with Suzanne Ellis Planning and Permitting. Thank you for the opportunity again, Chair Phillips. I just want to be very clear that there is no structure proposed with the uh, with this uh, lot split. Uh, going back to the trail, the property owners just simply weren't aware that there is a trail there. They've never been approached by it. They haven't seen anyone uh, uh, use the trail. Um, if indeed there is a trail there, um, the development envelope does not encroach upon the trail. And it looks like the trail may actually go on and off uh, property. Um, I, I would request that we don't continue this in order to study the trail. I, I think we talked about between staff that the county doesn't have an interest in it. It would be more of a private matter between the, uh, the uh, property owner and the Trails Foundation. And I would just hate to see you folks continue this on that basis to study the idea of a trail, which I think would kind of be a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we ask someone if they want to put a trail somewhere, I, I think the question uh, would be that even from scratch they would want to uh, possibly uh, uh, develop a trail. Um, we touched on the easement issue and that the easement I is mapped and, and certainly would remain even with uh, uh, the idea that the, uh, the uh, lot split would be approved. Um, in terms of, I'd like to go back to one of my slides because I think the, the view that we were looking at that had the power box, I think that's actually from uh, I, I believe it's the temp power, as it says, 1050 for the, um, I don't have my uh, uh, clicker, but I believe it's actually the temp power um, that's located on the, dri the existing approved driveway going into the site up in, uh, somewhere in this area, I believe. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. Sure. You need to come up and be on the record. Can you state Just your name, please? Yourself. Hi. Good morning. I'm Lisa Loiacano. Um, it appears that that photo, I don't know how to, um, it would be better if it was on the picture of the lot, but it, it appears that the, uh, the photo was not taken from the road. The temporary power pole is about right here on the driveway. And from the photo, it looks like it was taken right beside the pole. So that pole we had to erect for temporary power. And it's about right here, down on the driveway. Um, and just a note on this driveway, it's a non-issue because it was approved. It was posted. 
for the county, uh, for everyone to come in during the MBAR, and it's much safer. The other driveway was a steep s slope. This is a nice, clear, long, smooth entrance. So the driveway has been approved, and the pole is down here. So if you look at Steve's numbers, it's, it's much lower. I also wanted to hit on, uh, I believe a comment was made that a 25 or 30,000 square foot house may be developed. The FAR for a three acre lot such as this would, uh, th the recommended guideline is a 5,100 square feet, 5,100 square feet. Um, and again, as we discussed, any future structures would come back uh, through staff, through the MBAR. They would likely require uh, story poles based on whatever would be proposed at that time. Um, the height of any structure developed in the uh, development envelope uh, would be limited to 16 feet. There, there are provisions for that to go up to 19 feet in uh, a certain percentage of area, uh, but uh, the max is uh, 16 feet. And uh, I, I just kind of regret that this letter came at the last second. Mr. Weston is familiar with all of these BAR requirements and when a structure is proposed, what will be uh, required. And it's just unfortunate that we have to, uh, to deal with it now. But um, again, we, we've, uh, I pointed out the topography on the site and how we don't think that um, uh, any future structures would uh, impact that uh, public view from Coyote Road. Thank you. Thank you. We are now in um, the uh, public hearings closed, I'm sorry. The, um, the issues you're concerned about are really going to be done later, no matter what happens here. Um, some of these issues are just aren't before us because there's no building. All right, I'm going to open this up, sir. Come on up and let's hear what you have to say. I understand. It's right by the side of the road in about three or four feet. How do I get this? Yeah, the reason it looks a little big is because I did it on telephoto so you could see the islands and so forth. But it's right up by the driveway, right is the drive is that where the driveway comes out here? Right there? Is there a better way to see that? The, and it was taken from the road right at the entrance to the driveway. And that's where that box is. I, I what I would say is I would be willing to withdraw all objections if this panel would go there and look at that box and see if it's not right by the road. Thank you very much. And we're closed on public comment and the commission is in deliberation. And it is the pleasure of Mr. Overall to begin. Um, let's see, first, I want to, Nicole, have you changed your last name? You Mr. Have? Chair, Commissioner Overall, yes, I got married. My last name is now well, congratulations. Liu. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. And what is your last name? I'm sorry. Liu. Well, okay, <laughs> so noted. Hey, you will probably work upon occasion too, so. Um, in relationship to the, um, this, the uh, issue of raptor nest, I, I w wanted to be clear that there's nothing, I'm, I, I was a little unclear reading the negative deck, that there haven't been any, I, am I correct that there are no identified nesting sites on lot number, what will be parcel two? Mr. Chair, <coughs> Commissioner Overall, that is correct. We did have a bio study done and um, there, there were no um, nests found, but because of the, the trees on site and the general area, there's potential for nesting in the future, which is why we re required a, a survey prior to construction. Okay. On the uh, Montecito Growth Management Ordinance, to the best of my knowledge, this is the first time I've had occasion to look at one of these in terms of awarding points. Um, and in, in particular, I was looking at the 20 points awarded to Habitat and um, you, the uh, staff report gives as the explanation for the award. I, I assume 20 points is the maximum in this category, is that right? Mr. Chair, Commissioner, overall, um, 
the, the points are awarded as a whole 20 points or, or no points, basically, okay. in all of the categories. Okay. Um, you give as the um, explanation for the award, no areas mapped. Um, is that the standard uh, that's applied uniformly, or can there be other considerations? What, I mean, how, how would you determine to give 15 points or 10 points? What would be the, because this, I mean, this seems to me to be an area that has a degree of sensitivity because of the trees and whatnot, although it's not mapped, and I'm trying to understand how the points would, might work. Mr. Chair, Commissioner, overall, um, the, the there's a specific approved map, Montecito Biological Resources map, and so along with the Montecito Growth Management Ordinance, there's an application that describes the way you apply the points. And um, in talking with uh, staff in Long Range Planning who was working on the Growth Management Ordinance, the intent was for without a great deal of work to be done, um, someone to come in and be able to determine approximately how many points they could get on a property, basically, so they wouldn't be required to get an entire bio study any time they were looking at a piece of property. So that's why um, those points were tied to an official map that shows mapped habitat rather than to the potential for there to be any sort of biological resources on the site. So. Um, in this category and in all the other categories, if there is no habitat mapped on that specific map that we reference, they get the full 20 points, um, and there's not the ability to give them 15 points, five points. Thank you. Commissioner Burroughs. Thank you. The issue regarding um, views uh, from the residents and the um, uh, gates and that kind of thing, are those issues that would be resolved at a later date? Mr. Chair, Commissioner Burroughs, um, well, we, um, to a certain degree, I would say yes. Um, right now, we're doing the lot split, and we did apply some mitigation measures right. um, that will apply to, um, to the structures in the future. Um, but when they do go to build out the lot, they will be required to go to the Montecito Board of Architectural Review and to get a land use permit, which will be noticed to all of the neighbors. The MBAR will then go through their process and look at if, if they felt that they wanted to require story pools, they could do so. So um, most of the design issues in specific will be dealt with at a later date. Okay. Um, the concerns that I have are primarily in regard to the trail and whether or not there is a trail. Um, I would be most comfortable um, continuing this to a later day for more study on the trail until we had more information. I am most comfortable making a decision with all the information I need to make that decision. And I think that trail issue is not resolved and there seems to be nothing definitive <coughs> on that. And I appreciate Mr. Venable coming in to give us the information that he did. Commissioner. Yeah, I appreciate the public comment. The, that really helps us as a group to, to make a decision to understand the issues at hand. And I, too, uh, believe that this issue of site viewing and uh, obstruction would probably be dealt with at the permit time, not at the use time. However, I do have a question for staff, and that is uh, this is a public view issue uh, initially, did, would you think, do you have a comment on that public view? Is how, how much of the road would be Im involved in the public view issue? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Edelson, let me put up a um, aerial photo here. So the general area of view that um, I believe has been discussed is, is from parcel two, which is along this curve on the road. Mm -hmm. So um, what we did look at as staff was perhaps views from a car or from a person uh, walking along that road. And we looked at the change in grade um, in a couple locations and how that might impact. So um, for example, we looked at um, 
a six foot tall wall located inside the setback, which um, would, could be developed on the site. Um, based upon our calculation using the topographic maps that we have, that would, that wall, the top of that wall would still be approximately two to three feet below the line of sight of a motorist. We're, we assumed that the motorist size are at about three or four feet um, above the ground. Mm -hmm. So f from our calculations, they would still be able to see over the wall if it were located in the setback. We weren't considering the wall right on the right road right of way um, right next to the road because that would be something they need to come in and get an encroachment permit for. So based on that analysis, we think that a motorist would still be able to see over the wall and therefore also a, um, you know, someone who's four to six feet tall. As far as private view, uh, other than public view, do you see a problem anywhere? As far as private view, looking specifically from the Burles property, which is directly across from this one, um, we, I, I think there would be less of a concern because their property is raised again up above the road a number of feet. Um, so it would, you know, it would of course depend on the line of sight distance. But we did also look at the change in the elevation from the center of the building envelope to the road, similar to what Mr. Fort presented, and, and that's about 30 feet. So again, if you put a, in the center of the building envelope, if you put a 16 to 19 foot tall residence, it's still, below the line of sight from the road. Okay, so we'll deal with that at the time that there's a permit request. Uh, that would go to MBAR and, and for the public if they had concerns to, to view it. Thank you very much. I, I do want to make one statement that is for the record, I did not talk to Mr. Weston. I, I, somebody else called me and, and it wasn't Mr. Weston, so I just want that for the, for the public record. I still have concerns over the trail. I would hope that could be resolved. I realize it wasn't on the trail map, uh, but apparently it's had regular use over a period of time and I too I would be uh, in favor of some kind of a continuance for a short time maybe uh, maybe it could be resolved in in 60 days or less but that's that's my feeling thank you <coughs> miss Lou it's my understanding that the lot issue the lot split issue does not have before it um, any walls any building this is all hypothetical. Isn't it uncomfortable for you to talk about walls that aren't there? Because it is for me. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, I, well, <laughs> somewhat because it, it is something that can be looked at in the future and there is a, pu uh, a public process to, to look at those issues. Mm -hmm. But in terms of providing you with some information in case you had a desire to apply a condition on the height of walls or to require story poles in the future. That's um, See, that's where I'm uncomfortable. I don't want to not condition should uh, and lose an opportunity for the community to have a, a better building uh, result. But we c will go way beyond walls. I mean, we could, we could have hypotheticals that would far exceed that. Director Black, you're going to solve this problem for me. Oh, Mr. Chair, I'm not going to claim to solve this problem, but um, I do think there is a, a process um, and for, for looking at the specific details of, of uh, a project that would be developed on this lot in the future. It's not an unusual process. It's a very usual process mm -hmm. for Montecito where the project would go through the um, Montecito BAR um, a land use permit process and it would be appealable to your commission. So there certainly is um, recourse. What we've, if somebody's un unsatisfied with the design of the project, which we can't fully anticipate today, what we've tried to, to do is to provide you with information that shows it's not impossible or difficult to build in this on this particular lot in this particular building envelope um, given the site characteristics so I think that's really as far as we can go um, today and I I think um, Ms. Lewis demonstrated that adequately thank you director um, Ms. Lou it's possible that the owners will not build anything a lot split doesn't require that you build on it, uh, on the on the new lot or the or the surviving lot. mr. chair I'm, I'm gonna answer this uh, of course, it doesn't require that an, an, that a, an owner 
develop a parcel. I think it's an expectation. It, mm -hmm. It's a realistic expectation, but um, you know, we have many lots in the county that haven't been developed for a, a number of years. I don't know why anybody would go through this process if they didn't intend to mm -hmm. um, sell or develop the property, but um, mm -hmm. it's certainly possible. Thank you. One last question, um, I think. Uh, the lot number one, the building envelope seems unusually large. I would guess that was created when it was 8.3 acres. Mm -hmm. No? It's being created, by right now. It's being created right, now. right now. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that, how does that, how did you arrive at a suitable number for the, uh, for the envelope? Commissioner Phillips, um, the chair Phillips, the um, as I as as I went over in the background, there have already been um, land use permits, grading permits, and building permits issued for parcel one, and there is the grading has been done. As my understanding, the house is mostly completed on that lot. That those approvals were given prior to um, this lot split under land use permits. So when we looked at the project, um, we already had plans showing grading and development. Um, we drew the development envelope around the boundaries of the already approved development on the site because we had already given the entitlements for that development. So what we, we didn't want to draw a development envelope that would contradict mm -hmm. land use permits and grading permits that we had already mm -hmm. issued and that had to some degree already um, taken place. But that envelope reflected 8.3 acres and I don't know that the envelope would have been 2.4 acres on if, if the applicant had come in on a 5.3 acre site. Would you have gotten half of it as a building envelope? I don't think so. And should that be re-looked at? M Mr. Chair. We, we don't always require envelopes. And typically, they're constraint-driven in this particular case because of the way the site is developing. Um, so it's a not-to-exceed issue? It's more and protective and than... There's, and there's no guarantee that you can build everywhere within that envelope. I mean, there's obviously quite a number uh -huh. of trees located within the envelope, and we wouldn't anticipate that those trees would be removed. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Last question, Ms. Lou. Should that trail be identified and validated, would that defeat building on parcel two? Uh, it's outside Chair the envelope. Chair Phillips, it, it is well outside the envelope, so it would not impact development in that area. If it was a trail today, a viable trail, would there be any considerations, any anything that we would do because of its existence that would impact the decision on this lot split? Mr. Chair, Commissioners, I, I just want to address the trail issue in general terms first, and then we can, can get to your question. From my understanding of what, what we've heard today is it's, it's not a designated public trail, and the county has no, through county parks, has no interest in acquiring the trail. So I believe what we're talking about is a private, uh, some kind of private trail or some kind of private right mm -hmm. to a trail, maybe through prescriptive rights or some type mm -hmm. of easement. And that is not something that we can determine in this setting. If, um, Nor should we. That's, I mean, it's really outside the purview of the commission to decide whether, pri whether there's some type of private interest that has been acquired on this property. So I just wanted to make that clear. I'm not sure if we continued the item. I'm not sure what information we would be gathering because I believe that Ms. Liu has collected all of the information that we have access to mm -hmm on public rights to mm -hmm. the trail. Yeah, I think your analysis is correct. Um, very good. Any other questions for staff? Any other late thoughts? Um, all, all then, being that information that, that we've just been given, I will release my concern about extending it because of the trail. Yeah. Commissioner. Uh, I have a uh, question related to the um, building envelope designation. Uh, first as to parcel one, uh, does it cause any problems if we remove the, the building envelope? 
Chair Phillips, Commissioner Overall, um, what the building envelope does is basically restrict development on the site to going further than has already been approved. So if you remove the envelope, um, the, the development that has already been approved will continue, you know, as, as are already approved and future development could potentially go outside of that envelope. But of course, at that time, staff will also be looking at constraints such as slopes and um, trees and biological resources. So we will be doing additional review. Um, so if, if, you, if you removed the, the, the envelope, it would simply um, you know, allow, allow the potential for development to occur outside of that area. I think it, you could also argue but the existence of an overly large envelope also holds some measure of promise to the owner that should they want to expand, um, it's already been defined as a building envelope. So, um, and I see Ms. Black nodding her head. Um, mm. I would feel much more comfortable <coughs> if we removed the building envelope uh, designation on parcel one um, and then let uh, let the process unfold if and when they wanted to expand it. On parcel two? Um, now I'm coming to parcel two. I'm, I'm a little concerned on the size of, of part the parcel two building envelope. And I, the, the part that concerns me most is the, this part in the upper northwest corner of it. Um, and I'm not sure, si since it seems to go right in where trees are and a variety of things, I'm not sure why that was included. Maybe you could, I don't have the topography in front of me, so I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand if that building envelope could be restricted some. It seems overly generous to me. Mr. Mr. Chair and Commissioner Overall, um, I think it was mainly designated for slopes. I'll let Nicole address that. But we do have a tree protection plan mm -hmm. requirement on this as well. So. Um, even though there are areas where trees are in tr are included in the envelope, that doesn't mean that those trees can be removed. So they can sort of work together, those conditions. Ms. Lou, should we follow Commissioner Overall's uh, point and, and remove that constraint? MBAR then has an, a lot to consider as to siting and size and things like that. And, um, is that, is that they just don't have that envelope to consider w when it goes to them? Is that correct? Chair yeah. Phillip, oh, uh, Chair Phillips, on, on parcel one, there's already an approved monocytial BAR approved residence, so and and it's mostly constructed. So in the future, they they the MBAR, you know, if they demolish the structure, you know, they would need to look at it without the envelope. But um, I don't think it would That's have done. a great impact. Yeah. Um, if I could also mention, just in general, the envelopes are are um, de fairly strictly worded development envelopes, so they're intended to include um, landscaping, site walls, trails, um, basically almost all types of ground disturbance. So although um, a larger residence could be placed in, in, in perhaps the envelope for parcel two, it would also need to accommodate all of their, you know, swimming pools, hardscape, things like that. Yeah, I don't want MBAR coming back later and saying, could you give us an envelope, please, so we can proceed? They wouldn't, right? No. Um, all right. Um, Commissioner. Commissioner Burroughs. If um, if Commissioner, let me interrupt oh, you one second. Do you want to follow up? Yeah, I think I still have a, a question outstanding as to the upper no, tip right there. Pardon me. Uh, Why it was configured that way? Chair Phillips, uh, Commissioner Overall, uh, the initial proposer, proposal for the envelope was submitted by the applicant and, and was um, based upon a, a request on our part to keep it to slopes uh, and was revised a couple of times to keep it to slopes of 20% or less. So the main um, issue that we did look at were, was the slopes issue and then in terms of addressing the trees, we did apply the requirement for the arborist on site and a tree protection and replacement plan to address tree impact issues. Very good. Commissioner Overall. Uh, 
Commissioner Burroughs and then Mr. Idelson. Thank you. We had earlier testimony on the issue of the trail, that at one time there had been a gate at the bottom of the trail and that the whoever put the gate up was directed to remove the gate. Um, if the trail is not designated, can the property owner block the trail so that residents would not have use of the trail? That's a private matter, I think. Yeah. Yes. Is the answer yes? Could be. Mr. Chair and Commissioner Burroughs, I think the answer is um, you can't prevent it from being blocked um, as a commission, and it's really a, a private issue that may need to be resolved in a different venue. Uh, Commissioner Idelson, I've ignored Commissioner Gottsdanker's light, and I. <laughs> I'm going to continue to ignore Commissioner Gottsdanker, and you can go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, you know, I think the purpose of the Montecito Planning Commission is to allow people to respond and get as much information as we can on every issue when we make a decision. And I know this is a little bit out of order, but I would like to ask the commission to consider uh, allowing Mr. Derek Weston to speak. He did write a letter and and uh, came here today, so. I would like to extend that if, if the commission will agree. Um, okay. Um, I don't want to open this up again unless there is something very, very new, Mr. Weston. Uh, if not, I think you've laid out your position. Um, Well, I guess we're open. If it would be brief, sir. I, I will be very, very brief. So I apologize that I could not be here when you first um, convened this matter. I had a conflicting hearing before the uh, city. Um, I, I don't know if you accepted my letter. I would appreciate it we if, have. You, if you would. Thank you. Um, the only concern I have, um, I, I, under, I listened closely. I understand uh, your position. Um, my only concern is that, that I believe it's correct that a wall can be built without any permit and without applying for um, a residence at all as long as it's outside of the setback. I have not personally verified and, and, and really don't know for sure that a wall outside of the setback would not impact public views. Uh, so that was the reason for our request um, that the applicant, w which has all of that information, uh, provide a study. I think. You know, this is a brand new matter. Um, to have the applicant demonstrate that there is no conflict with public views, I think, is a reasonable request. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. We're closing public comment again. Commissioner Gottstenker. Okay. <laughs> I, I actually had just been waiting and been willing to wait because um, obviously this is my neighborhood, this is where I live. This is, um, I've actually worked on this property when it belonged to um, Mrs. Tremaine. I worked on the property for eight years. I was probably one of the gardeners that um, Michelle Humboldt um, uh, referred to that trimmed up the trees along the quote unquote trail, um, which I would probably call a footpath just for. Um, just to get it out of this world of like a real, tra a designated trail as opposed, or a public trail as opposed to a private trail, I would refer to it a as a footpath. I think uh, Mrs. Humboldt's comments were absolutely, completely accurate. I've li I lived, when I first moved to this neighborhood, I lived on Banana Road, which was 1964, 65, and 66. And this was for the community a foot trail and they can be still found throughout the community. This is a neighborhood or a community that walks from neighbor to neighbor, you know, and there, there's probably trails like this or footpaths like this. You would take aerials, you'd probably find them on every map, any map. Um, I personally don't think having to put this applicant through the process of deciding whether this should be a made a public trail is really appropriate given that would be undo something or other for this applicant when we're not we're going to require me, you know, I mean I've got, you know, trails that go from 
Mountain Drive through my property all the way to Gibraltar Road, two or three of them. You know, I think this is a case where I think it's more like a good neighbor policy. You know, and as Ms. Humboldt said, yes, the gate had been locked. I don't think as the Planning Commission or as an pl individual planning commissioner that there's any condition that I could put on to this project. I would just ask that this property owner somehow create mm -hmm. some, as, as county council, or some private deed or however one does that, you know, so that it's not a public trail, but it's somewhere allows, you know, the neighbors or whoever to pass through, you know. I mean, and she's right, that gate was locked. That gate has never been locked up until the, they bought the property. So, um, you know, and it is, it is used, you know, periodically. I mean, my kids used to walk to school down that trail. They used to walk down that trail, across the ravine, and over to Westmont and down to Cold Springs. That's just the nature of our neighborhood. Now, um, the concern about the walls and fences, this actually is a neighbor, I mean, it's not just this neighbor's concern, it's a whole neighborhood concern. This is a part of Montecito which does not have a lot of walls and fences. I think if you drive through there, you'll see that it's only very, very new development, and I would say probably in the last five to ten years when, when people have come and bought lots. Um, but for those of us who've lived there for the last 30, 40, or 50 years, we don't, we don't have walls and fences. In fact, we don't even really like walls and fences. And probably if you were to go back to the records, every time a new wall or fence goes up in our neighborhood, Public Works hears about it. I mean, it's been an issue for years, and it's still an issue. Um, since the fire because walls and fences have been put up that are certainly the right of the owners to do so, but it really has impacted the quality of this particular neighborhood when mostly it's all about open space and we've all learned to live and get along with our neighbors without having to have walls and fences. And so to address that issue for me, I would want somehow the thought of placing a condition on um, the lot split which would um, say that all future walls, fences, and gates must be contained within the designated development envelopes. That solves the problem for everybody. They don't, they're not going to be up on the road. The fire department will drive down. Their gates will be down inside the development envelopes and there will be not an impact to views at all. So that's the condition that I would recommend at this point was just that all walls and fences, security walls, whatever you want to call them, be inside the designated development envelope. That gets them off the roads, gets them off, gets them away from everybody. Um, so that's that one. And then the last, my last, um, comment is to, um, as has been referred to some by some of the other commissioners, the size of the building envelopes. I find these building envelopes to be completely oversized. I do not see the purpose for them. On lot parcel one, the 5.3 acre one, it goes far beyond the grading, the existing development. You know, it would then allow for guest houses, barns, and all, anything that a five acre parcel can hold. And so my feeling is that this building envelope should be shrunk, you know, to really be, you know, to contained around what's been developed there. I mean, there's like, you know, you've got whole oak forests and all kinds of things. And yeah, we've got tree protections and we know how that goes in our community. We just cut down the trees and then we come in for a permit. That's what happens, you know. So I, you know, I don't, you know, I think that those, that building envelope should be constrained, you know. Um, as far as the building envelope on parcel two, um, I happen to have three acres on Mountain Drive. My building, and I, I could build the maximum footprint that I can build on my parcel is 3,500 square feet, not a half an acre, you know. 
And I also feel like that envelope should come down because when I went and had the first conversations with Suzanne Illich's office and, and Laurel Perez, my understanding that the proposed building was going to be kind of lower down on the lot, and I really don't understand, I mean, I got the, we've got the driveway, but I really, as Commissioner Overall, don't understand that kind of point that goes up there. You know, I think where the house needs to be located is further down, and I don't know why we haven't included, you know, some of that open space that's already, that, that meadow space, you know, it sort of seems like it needs to shift down from there. So, <coughs> Um, I think that's all, yeah, I think that's all I've got, you know. Thank you. I mean, I'd love to condition parcel two, and this is very personal, so that the house couldn't be, you know, a massive house. I mean, we don't have, the, right here we've got the two biggest houses in the entire neighborhood, as far as square footage is concerned. And the neighbors, and by the way, historically, the neighbors actually did come in and um, at MBR, MBAR argued the size of both of those houses based on neighborhood compatibility. The average size house in our neighborhood, no matter what size lot, is about 2,200 square feet. So it doesn't, so we don't have, even on our one acre lots, we don't even come up to the max, you know. And there, you know, as new development has happened, it really has really eroded and undermined the compatibility of the size of houses that are going to get built and have been built since the fire. You know, there's nobody that rarely, this is one of the few lots where anything got bigger after the fire. There's only two other, two other ones where, where land use permits were required because they wanted bigger houses. So we're still very consistent with being a neighborhood of very, very small houses, approximately 30% lower than the FARs allow for. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, you know, again, this is hypothetical, what's going to happen there. But let me ask you this. May we uh, approve these lot splits without building envelopes? Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, yes, you could do that, or you could take an envelope off of one and leave it on the other. Because I'm not prepared to know whether the cut is pr appropriate, and I don't know that it should be done up here. Uh, will MBAR have an, uh, an opportunity to work with staff and create a building envelope? No. So there will be none. Mr. Chair, if I could just clarify, so I think the... The negative declaration does not rely on the development envelope designated on parcel one, but it does rely on the building envelope or development envelope designated on parcel two, mainly as it pertains to slopes. All right. Well, we have an issue before us as to whether that building envelope on parcel two is cited properly, and I don't know how to get to it. Um, do we... Um, the envelope ended up how it is Hang on a second. Let me, I may be getting there. Um, so we'd like to hear more testimony on it, I think. Is that it, Commissioner? Or do we just want to pull it down? Can we do that, bring it down? Here's the thing from my point of view as far as what you're struggling with, Chairman Phillips, is um, I think if we make any requests or to building envelopes or, um, I mean, this just is how I see it, um, we, we've got to continue the project, you know. I mean, we can't really design building envelopes up here, up here today so that we could then approve the project. I, I don't, that, you know, we could add a condition, as I proposed, around walls and fences being within the, but we can't relocate. Those are actually um, surveyed lines now. And so we can't just willy-nilly start drawing building envelopes. So there seems to be a concern both by the applicant and some of the other commissioners that we not continue this project. So those were, all, those were my comments. I'm not trying to redesign the project here today can, so that we have an approvable project. Can, can we get enough direction to staff to make a continuance worthwhile? Will, will they know how to... I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm in a particularly 
awkward position here as to what I do, which is why I've been really quiet and why I've limited comments. I'm not going to really make any recommendations to this project because it is so kind of close to home for me. Mr. Chair, a if, director. if I could just make a, a comment. Um, first of all, this isn't a building envelope. It's a development envelope. And those well, are two the very different things. This is the area where we believe, given the other project conditions, site disturbance is appropriate. That doesn't mean we expect to see uh, residents yeah. wall to wall in the 0.62 acre area. Right. Um, there are other conditions that, that govern um, mm -hmm. where development can occur and where development can't occur. They need to be compliant with the Montecito design guidelines. I mean, there are lots of other layers. This is just mm -hmm. a rough tool to say, outside of these areas, mm -hmm. it's not okay to um, to conduct site mm -hmm. disturbance activities. So I think it's really important to kind of keep that in context. We're mm -hmm. not suggesting they should have a home, home that's wall to wall, mm -hmm. wall to wall within this 6.62 acre. That will be discussed in detail when it During comes up. During the design review phase. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Commissioners, and then um, if, go ahead. If I can make one other comment. With respect to the walls, I think Ms. Mayshore um, provided you with some analysis of how visible walls would be if they were located outside of the setback areas, um, not contiguous with the development envelope per se, but outside of the setback areas. And her assessment is that they would not preclude public views from Coyote Drive or private views north of Coyote. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioner. Yeah, I feel we have enough layers of issues for approval to deal with the concerns that have been brought up here and really we're looking at a lot split at this point mm -hmm. and I think all the other issues have been can be handled later on that are of concern and so I'm ready to make a motion to approve of the staff report on this lot split. So noted uh, motion to approve staff's recommendation. Is there a second? I second it. Uh, is there uh, discussion? Commissioner overall. Um, I think the lot um, split probably ought to be approved, but I, uh, I'm troubled by two things. I, I really am uh, uncomfortable with the, the development envelopes as they're drawn uh, currently. Um, my remedy for parcel one was to remove it my remedy for parcel two would be to look at it more closely and see if that northwest flag can be removed. Um, and then beyond that, I, um, I felt that Commissioner Gottstanker's suggestion about including the walls and gates uh, within the um, development envelope is a pretty sound way to assure uh, that we don't end up with a controversy about height and all that. So I, if, if we can accommodate those concerns, um, I can support it. I think as it is right now, I have a little trouble. Any other comments? I have a little trouble also, and I would follow um, Mr. Overall's lead and say if we could accommodate those two uh, concerns. I, I'm supportive of the lots, but it's just that there are so many questions that seem to be left unanswered, in my opinion. I, um, I think the questions left unanswered are to be, are unanswerable at this point because we're, we're theoretically, we're in theory. Um, I can support Commissioner Overall's uh, withdrawal of the development envelope on parcel two. I don't want to preclude the app on parcel one. I don't want to preclude the applicant from the full enjoyment of their property and um, should a wall be their pleasure outside of the building envelope and it otherwise meets criteria, I wouldn't want to preclude it here. So I'm at odds with Mr. Overall on that issue, but not on the first. <coughs> um, so we have a motion and a second. Um, Commissioner Idelson, would you consider amending the motion to incorporate um, my recommendation would be part of Commissioner Overall's uh, comments, but um, 
what's your thought? You, you're on the lead here. Yeah, I would, uh, I would accept that. Uh, I want to point out, though, that the larger you make the development envelope, the more control the future developers have in, in, in regulating it. But going with, uh, with what you want to do, I'll, I'll approve a change. So what's the motion? I think it's to approve staff's recommendation with deletion of the envelope on parcel one. If, is that correct? That's okay with me. And then we would ask that you also accept the environmental health services letter as a condition. Yes. So the motion is to accept staff's recommendation with uh, Commissioner Overall's proposed amendment to withdraw the development envelope on parcel one and to uh, adopt the, um, the health uh, letter as to, I forgot the issue, but he wanted something done. Should, it's a condition for Ms. us. Mr. Chair, it's just a condition letter um, from Environmental Health Services dated December 13th, so to include that in the, in the conditions of approval. All right, we have a motion, we have a second. Um, Commissioner? Outside, I'm going to vote to support the motion. But as a personal note, I would like to ask the applicants to remember, please, the good neighbor policy in Montecito, which has served us so well for so many years in regard to. No, great, no, no. Thank you. In regard to the trail. I just need to respond with the good neighbor policy. Um, we want to be good neighbors. We, I just feel like everyone is, we're going to wreck, thinks we're going to wreck this huge home and walls, and we're not, and we haven't. We didn't apply for that with our first home. We shrunk the first home to 4,200 square feet. This originally started because the Brills wanted us to trim the oak trees. That was the original. Uh, that's why he called me in the beginning. There's no view easement. There was no agreement to trim the trees. That's what this stemmed from. All this trail stuff, everything, came out now because we didn't trim their trees. I love trails. I hike. No one has ever asked me. Um, I didn't, I don't, Christopher Lloyd, the owner of the property, he's never been asked to unlock the gate. No one asked me to unlock the gate. I would gladly have a trail there. It's never been brought to me. I'm, I'm, I'm a hiker. I love nature. I love living up there. I don't want to build a big house and walls and keep people out. That's not who I am. That's not what I'm about. So it's just, it's hurting me to watch all this discussion. So I just want you to know who I am and what we, we're planning to do there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then I would express uh, the appreciation, I'm sure, of many people in Montecito. And um, Montecito is special exactly because we all do try to be good neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. We have a motion. We have a second. Uh, I call the question and a vote. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Um, note that Commissioner Gottstanker votes no. And it passes. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, if we could take a five-minute break, that would be great. Commission meeting of December 15th, 2010. And we are moving to item... Standard agenda item number three. Mr. Villalobos, if you would read us into the record, we'll uh, begin. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Planning and Development Department will provide information to the Montecito Planning Commission regarding proposed amendments to the Montecito Land Use and Development Code and the County Land Division regulations that are currently being developed by Planning and Development Department staff. Thank you very much. Mr. Langle, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the Montecito Planning Commission. Uh, the purpose of this uh, briefing today is just to uh, advise you of several ordinance amendments that our staff is currently working on that we bring, we plan to bring to you in early 2011. These, this work is part of the ongoing process improvement efforts by the Planning and Development Department that we've been doing for several years now. These issues areas that we are uh, working on have come from several different sources. Uh, some problems that we identified during the processing and adoption of the land use and development codes. 
um, issues that were reviewed by the Process Improvement Oversight Committee, as well as uh, issues that have been identified through zoning enforcement uh, efforts. So the purpose of this session is to acquaint your commission with the proposed ordinance amendments that we are currently working on and to receive any comments and feedback from the commission on these uh, areas. The first issue is in regards to automobiles and material storage. Uh, what we have, what we're trying to address here is uh, properties that, um, where there are a large number of automobiles parked on the property and where a lot of materials is stored outside that can create a visual blight to the neighborhood and cause neighborhood compatibility problems. And so what we're proposing is that within residential zones, the proposal would regulate the number of autom automobiles that can be stored outside as well as placing limits on the exterior area that can be devoted to the storage of materials. As part of the ordinance requirements, we would include uh, requirements for fencing and screening of any such areas devoted to parking, exterior parking, and material storage. Also providing that the both the number of automobiles and the amount of material storage could be increased through a minor conditional use permit process uh, within the county. Uh, such a minor CUP would go to the zoning administrator, but within the Montecito planning area, um, all such uh, CUPs would go through your commission for review and approval. This would be a discretionary crop process, of course, and would allow that in particular situations where the, the owner uh, could demonstrate the need for increased numbers and your commission felt that uh, it was appropriate and compatible with the neighborhood, it could be approved through the minor CUP process. We're also proposing that noncompliance with uh, these new standards would be deemed a violation of the development code, but also include a six-month grace period from the adoption of the ordinance so that people could bring their properties into compliance. This is a little different than uh, other ordinance amendments that we adopt where a situation that's pre-existing to the adoption of the new ordinance would be considered non-conforming. In this particular instance, we feel that it's appropriate to um, provide a time limit for these existing situations to be brought into compliance so there would be no lingering nonconformity. Mr. Langer, would you prefer uh, questions at your conclusion or as we go? I think as you go would be probably more appropriate. We have one for you, Commissioner. Thank you. We have more than one. We have three. Good. Am I ready? Uh, we say within residential zones would regulate the exterior area devoted to the storage of materials. What does that mean? Are those the temporary buildings that are brought in? Um, yeah. Could you please tell me what that means? Uh, Mr. Bath Chair and, and Commissioner Burroughs, <laughs> some people like to keep things on their property um, that may not be necessarily related to an actual construction, ongoing construction, but just things that they acquire and keep for their own personal use. So this is what we would be proposing to regulate to control the area devoted to the keeping of such materials and include some requirements that those areas be screened. So they would not pose a visual incompatibility with the uh, neighboring. And so we would not be defining our materials. Oh, sorry. We would not be defining materials? Uh, it would be defined to more or less include everything. So anything <laughs> of a material nature <laughs> would be regulated. Mr. Langle, these are countywide, or are they just <coughs> Montecito proposals? This, uh, all the uh, proposed amendments that we will be discussing with you today are included in the countywide proposal as well. There were some that we uh, are doing for the county mm. that we're not including with the Montecito because it's not really appropriate or necessary. Interesting that you lead with automobiles H has there been enough out outcry to uh, prompt this yeah. mr. chair members of the commission yes there has been um, some recent fires have uh, brought the situation to light uh, whereas before they were not quite so uh, out in the open so to speak but it's it's an issue that's cropped up in both North County and South County 
and we felt it was appropriate to address at this time. These are operable automobiles, um, licensed, ready to go. Um, yeah. In Mr. Chair, not always in all situations, uh, but in certain situations, yes, these are uh, where people are are car collectors, uh, and they're all operable. They all can be moved. They're all um, licensed. If Mr. Idelson has to give away his Corvette, there's going to be <laughs> trouble. I, I can tell. Yeah, I notice. Uh, you know, looking back at many, many years ago at our cities, it was really pretty uncommon to see a car overnight at the curb. And you go through Santa Barbara right now, for instance, the city, and very few houses you find that don't have cars out at the curb. In fact, it's almost a blight. You have a trouble finding a parking place after seven or eight o'clock. So in the county, my, my interest in this ordinance idea, would this be from public view or would this also be from private view? Because th they would be two different views quite a bit because some people may have uh, vehicles in the back of their yard or somewhere in the rear that would be very visible to another home. A uh, private public view would be that that you would see from any public right of way or street. Uh, could you respond to that? Yes, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Eilison. Uh, first, I'd be happy to provide an area for you to keep your Corvette on my property. Okay. If, if I could drive it. <laughs> uh, secondly, I, I should mention that what we're considering is a uh, number of cars in excess of a certain number, and that number we haven't arrived at yet. And so for the, the normal cars that are used every day by the people residing on the property, we're not proposing to... Uh, to restrict the, the use in, in that manner. It's just for, uh, let's say, if you're keeping 15 cars on your property, that let's say 10 of those cars would have to be stored in such a manner that they would not be, that would, they would be screened from both public and private views. Okay. Thank you. One more second, Mr. Langle. Commissioner, Dr. Uh Yeah, well, I mean, it, Mr. Langley, you answered one of my questions, which was going to be um, what kind of numbers are we talking about here? And you answered that question. Um, the other thing that um, comes to mind for me, though, is um, we say within residential zones, is there going to be any variable on the number of cars based on the size of the lot? I mean, that would be something that would be, you know, I, I, I just, you know, I mean, you know, all of it, you know, sudden all of this becomes personal. I also have an 81 Corvette that belongs to one of my sons, you know, so it, there it sits. It's operable and non-operable right now, per the, because why, why go through it when it's not being driven? But, um, you know, the impact of the number of vehicles to neighbors and um, the public from, say, my lot, which is three acres, that's way different than one, you know. I mean, I, I've got way more room to store more vehicles than somebody with a one-acre lot that's, that's not in the rural area, you know. So that, that is something I think that you might want to look at as you go through this process. Mr. Chair and Commissioner Gostanker, that's an excellent point. We'll certainly uh, consider that as part of the development of the ordinance. Another thing that um, your question brought to my mind is that uh, we probably should address the RMZ zone in Montecito as well. Um, with in, in the inland or the, the non-Montecito portion of the county, typically the problem has only occurred within the, the residentially zoned properties themselves, and we don't want to. Uh, focus on the ag zones in particular. For Montecito, it's a little bit different though because the residential zoning is, is um, where the smaller lots are. However, within the RMZ zone, given the visibility of some of these sites, it may be appropriate to address that zone as well as part of this ordinance amendment. So moving on to the next issue. Uh, conditional certific certificates of compliance. I know that your commission has wrestled with these um, on occasion. Uh, currently, we do not have any real procedures that address how to process a conditional certificate of compliance within our county regulations. The only mention of them 
is in Chapter 21. The subdivision regulations where it uh, determines that the um, the zoning administrator, or within Montecito, the, the Montecito Planning Commission, is the review authority for conditional certificates of compliance. However, we do have a process uh, whereby the person who makes an application for a certificate first goes to the county surveyor. The county surveyor then determines whether or not that the lot was created legally and thus is eligible for a non-conditional certificate, or if it was not created legally, and therefore should go through the conditional certificate process. Once that determination is made, the county surveyor directs the applicant to apply to our department to then process a conditional certificate. These certificates are subject to CEQA, and the review authority, be it the zoning administrator or the Montecito Planning Commission, would make the appropriate, uh, would determine what the appropriate conditions are through the public hearing process, and then those conditions are recorded with a certificate. That's the existing process. Our proposal is just to codify that within Chapter 21. <coughs> Moving on to the next issue regarding the phasing of conditional use permits and development plans. Uh, we run into situations where a project that is being proposed as part of the development plan or a conditional use permit is <coughs> one that's fairly large, is not is expected to be built out over several years, and we found that in some situations our normal timelines for uh, initial approval of those either CUP or, or development plans and combined with any potential time extensions are not sufficient to account for the, the uh, build out um, timeline of the particular project and so what we're proposing to do is add to the ordinance the ability to adopt a phasing plan as part of the appro approval of the CUP or the DP this would be adopted by the review authority at the time the overall project is uh, approved and could then be later modified by that review authority if necessary uh, a lot of times this comes into play with uh, with churches where they have a, a s um, several buildings they want to erect, but a lot of times their fundraising is, is such that it takes several years to acquire the necessary funds to build all phases of the project. Uh, Mr. Langwell, can you spell out who the, in our case, who the applicable review authorities might be? Um, Mr. Chair and Commissioner overall, Within Montecito, it's basically going to be you for any of <laughs> these types of projects that are large enough to require a phasing plan. Okay. The next issue area is indemnification. Uh, currently, we have as one of our standard conditions of approval that the applicant, um, based on a project approval, agrees to indemnify the county from any uh, lawsuits brought against the county for their approval of the project uh, what we're proposing to do is include this within the uh, application procedures that a defense and indemnification be uh, agreement be submitted at the time that the project is is applied for and then if the project is approved that then that um, agreement would then be signed and recorded such that if a lawsuit were brought to bear by an aggrieved party that the applicant is then uh, in agreement to indemnify the county um, from any such lawsuits. Commissioner. What um, mechanism uh, do we utilize to assure that the indemnifier can in fact step to the plate? Um, Mr. Chair and Commissioner overall, uh, Mike Munoz may want to respond to this. I don't think we have any particular mechanism, but if we um, don't receive um, payment for our services, then we discontinue or recommend to the Board of Supervisors discontinuation of supporting the, the litigation. So we have a fairly good uh, control mechanism if the Board wants to exercise it. 
Uh, I'm sorry, you're going to need to explain that again. I didn't quite. We follow actually it. we actually bill people for services through county council's office and indemnifying an action by the county. So we bill the real property. Um, uh, so we're the, the county is defending the person to whom we granted the permit. Is that correct? We are def we are um, on occasion in a position of defending the county's action on a permit. So uh, the Board of Supervisors approves a permit and a third party um, brings litigation on that approval of the permit or the CEQA document. We defend that action. This um, indemnification condition allows us to bill the real property interest for our costs. <coughs> and we do that pretty regularly throughout uh, litigation mm -hmm. and if the real property owner the real property interest doesn't pay their bills then we report that to the Board of Supervisors and they can um, decide whether or not to go forward so we already have some leverage this provides us with more leverage um, legally having it in an ordinance an example would probably be um, the Westmont situation did Westmont indemnify the county for the lawsuit brought by the neighbors you um, Mr. Chair, I believe they did. I don't. I ju I can't speak specifically to individual cases, and I don't think it's really per perhaps very appropriate to do so here. But mm -hmm. th that that would be an example where we would have rec we would have included an indemnification mm -hmm. condition, and where it would be strengthened by having this mm -hmm. ordinance provision. This is a this puts the uh, the successful applicant in a terrible situation where he's very willing to make compromise because he doesn't want to pay the county's uh, fees. I mean, it's, uh, is this a typical uh, requirement? Do other counties do this? M this Mr. is unusual, I think. Mr. Chair, well, it's very typical for our county to do it, and I think many other counties and cities and other jurisdictions have uh, similar requirements. If, if I could continue just for a second, because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand what the consequence is. We. The, the county elects not to continue defending the action. What is the consequence at, at that point? Mr. Chair, Commissioner overall, uh, basically what this becomes is it's, a, it's an agreement contract that would otherwise um, have to be enforced um, as any other contract would be. I think he's asking what would the courts, how would the courts handle an objection to a building uh, permit where the government, the county, refuses to demonstrate that their procedure was in the normal course of whatever and it came to it in, in the proper way. Does that leave the holder of the building permit without a defense? Um, Mr. Mr. Chair and members of the commission, um, basically what we would be looking at in a situation where the county um, perhaps decides to not continue to defend um, at that point um, there could be several things that could occur at that point it could be a matter of um, we can continue to defend without receiving any money for that indemnification that can be one option Another option would be to um, seek an order from a court to have those monies paid by whoever that project applicant was. Whether or not there is any money for them to actually pay would be a different question. Um, I mean, th that's nice really what we're looking at. <laughs> In many of those cases, it, it could also be a situation such that the permit has actually already been um, even granted or uh, approved at that point in which case they would have the, the permit but it would become a matter of enforcing that agreement with that project applicant to seek to recover the monies spent in defending that uh, approval so it would occur even on an application for a lot split like we saw today my my mr. chair in, in the uh, uh, <coughs> parcel map uh, conditions of approval there was a condition that requires that that applicant indemnify the county in the event of a lawsuit so we're not changing the requirement we're changing or we're improving our ability to uh, enforce the permit condition 
So it's, it's a very standard approach the county's been taking for quite a number of years. Household pets are not probably a burning issue, but um, during the processing of the development code, we did realize that even within within several zone districts and, and mainly within the county development code, there were zone districts that allowed for residences, yet household pets uh, uh, commonly kept within the household were, were not allowed uh, within those zone districts. So we're going through and cleaning up the zoning ordinance, so to speak, and providing that within zones that do allow for residences that we uh, provide the ability for a person to keep a household pet. Uh, this would only affect within Montecito the neighborhood commercial zone at this point in time. All other zones that allow residences do actually allow for household pets. Uh, the next issue area is uh, modification process. Uh, for certain, there are certain uh, zone standards that can be modified uh, outside of a variance, uh, heights, setbacks, things of that nature, provided that the modification request uh, fits within the restrictions on how large the modification request is so that within a setback area, for example, you can't modify it any less than a certain number of feet. Uh, within a modification for a height, you can't go over a certain number of feet of the height limit. Currently, these do require a, a public hearing and in Montecito that would go to the Montecito Planning Commission uh, for hearing. What we're proposing is to adopt a waived hearing process so that on those situations where we feel the modification request is very minor and does not rise to the need to go through the full public hearing, that we provide notice to the neighbors that the modification request is, is in process and that it's our intent to waive the hearing on this, but then allow that if a neighbor uh, does wish to have a, a public hearing, that then if that request is made to the department, we would then go through with the public hearing. This is very similar to a number of uh, permits, uh, let's say within the coastal zone for, tip, for projects that typically require public hearing because they're located within the appeals jurisdiction for minor development. We do have this wave hearing process currently and we did adopt this recently within 2008 uh, for both Montecito and the rest of the county for time extensions. So this is, uh, would be uh, proposing to add this process uh, ag again to the uh, modification. Um, Mr. Langle, would the um, the areas where where you would apply this, where a variance is not required, would they in the ordinance would they be quantified? As an example, if you've got a 16 foot height limitation, um, would it have to rise to some, I mean, fall within some threshold uh, in order to meet this that will be spelled out in the ordinance, or will it be simply left to somebody's discretion? Mr. Chair, Commissioner, overall, uh, excellent question. I should probably have brought the existing ordinance uh, language with me, but those uh, areas that are subject to this uh, ability are all spelled out in the ordinance and there are restrictions as to how far you can go through a modification. Beyond those thresholds, you would be then uh, have to go through the variance process. I would just say it would be nice to have a, a glance at that when you get get them to the point we can see the actual language. So, Mr. Lang, aren't, aren't all isn't all of these coming back to us when they're actually written and we've got the language in front of us? Yes, Mr. Chair. Yeah, okay. And, and Commissioner Gossanker, our our purpose here is just to introduce these items with your commissioners get feedback from you and which we've received uh, excellent feedback so far and then once we come back to you with the formal ordinance amendments you will have the full language and at that point in time you'll be able to see uh, those things that are subject to modification mm -hmm. and the limitations on those in regards to temporary uses uh, we've discovered in certain situations that there's an um, unintended loophole that allows for a person to more or less use, use their property on a continuing basis for, let's say, uh, a wedding venues 
without having to go through the minor or the conditional use permit process. Um, and they do this by renting the entire property to a, a particular person for a, uh, for a short time period and then that person can then avail themselves um, of the, uh, the language within the development code currently that provides that uh, non-profit type temporary uses are, are not subject to the permit requirement. So what we're proposing to do is to close this loophole by defining um, a minimum term of occupancy that would be required, uh, such as 30 days, and also by uh, limiting the number of events that can occur within a certain calendar year period. Mr. Langle, <coughs> there's an active um, wedding business going on on Butterfly Beach. Is that, um, is that something that comes before you, you all for permits? Have, are you aware of that? Um, Mr. Chair and Commissioners, if it's occurring on the sand itself mm -hmm. and not on private property, that would be. Well, I'm not. I'm not certain. Um, if, do you mind one second, and then we'll we'll get back to because uh, I'm curious about this because I've heard a lot about it. If it's within a county park, then the county park department would you would, would get have a permit at that to point. That. We're recognizing the Montecito Association to clarify this. Ms. Mr. Green, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> Victoria Green. Um, we get calls all the time at our office mm -hmm. about use of Butterfly Beach for weddings. Mm -hmm. And it's not a county park, but, um, you know, below the mean high tide line, it's public beach. And so um, weddings do occur there. Yeah. You know, we share with um, those planning to throw, you know, there's no fee, there's nothing like that, but people do hold their weddings there. There are some criteria that we um, express to them, you know, oh, about the business. There's buses the that come from LA. It's a big deal. Yeah. I've seen. So it's uh, it's county property. It's at a public. certain point. It's public. It's public. Yeah. I, it's In fact, the, the property owners own that, don't they? Generally, um, generally they're um, on the ocean side of um, Channel Drive. There, there. Are private properties, you know, where the mean high tide line is drawn and where those properties start. I, you know, I don't know where that actually is <laughs> in all cases, one. but um, below the mean high tide line in California is public. It's public beach, so it's not county property or anybody's property. I think that the county parks does some maintenance of the stair access at Butterfly, but they do not consider it a public park mm -hmm. or a county park. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify something. That I think I understand it. But what, what we're saying in um, bullet point two is that if someone is going, and I think your example was really great, lease or rent a piece of property for Saturday, Sunday <coughs> in preparation and having the wedding on Sunday, that um, there's currently you have to get a permit for that. No, you do not need a permit for that. So, so when it says specify that in order to be exempt from a permit, what permit are they then exempt from by leasing the property for 30 days? I, I don't quite understand how those two things work together. If we don't have to get a permit for a weekend wedding, why would we now, we how, what are we exempting them from? Mr. Chair, Commissioner Gostanker, if let's say you own a piece of property in Montecito, and you want to be able to rent this piece of property out for, let's say, weddings or other special events every weekend, then currently you would be required to obtain a conditional use permit. Oh, in so, okay, so it's not like on a one-time basis when somebody decides. This is like where there's on, an ongoing, com uh, apparently commercial use going on. The, okay, great. Yeah, Mr. Chair. And Commissioner Gottstinker, there are a number of properties in the county that are known to be sort of event properties. Yeah. And the way that people get around our um, requirements is they rent out the property for the weekend, people throw a party, they're considered the tenant, mm -hmm. you know, they're the residential oh, yeah. user for that weekend, and so they're 
exempt under the ancillary to a residential use and that's what we're really trying to break is the tie between the two and this would in no way affect the nonprofit use of a property for an event mr. chair and commissioner Burroughs the ordinance currently provides exemptions for nonprofit type events where the owner does not receive any money in exchange for the use of the property. Th this would not affect those types of situations. Uh, just would point out though that, that there are a number of um, properties that operate under conditional use permits that prescribe how frequently they can hold events. So there's some I mean it doesn't fall right within this but there are limitations on it mr. chair and commissioner overall yes for example the music Academy of the West I believe has specific conditions within their CUP that spells out how that property can be used sure. for events other than yeah. those well even those that are sponsored by the music mm -hmm. Academy uh, the, the, the facility is available for uh, for weddings and I believe it does restrict that type of situation provides hours of operation things like that this would not affect those types of, of permitting mm -hmm. okay in regards to trailers um, this is the purpose purpose of this is to address an ongoing issue we've had with uh, people wanting to keep trailers on their property other than what the ordinance currently addresses which essentially is just RVs and trailers of that nature so these trailers would be things like um, something you would attach to the back of your car that you could haul materials on uh, material uh, trailer that you could put your boat or jet ski on things like that horses uh, a horse trailer is an excellent example yes so what this would do would be to amend the ordinance that would allow such trailers to be kept on residential lots as accessory to that residential use um, Provided that they are that they meet the existing requirements for RV type uh, trailers, and that is that they're uh, screened from public view, and that they're not kept in the uh, front or side yard set required setback areas. So, <coughs> currently, my understanding is one is allowed to have store a trailer on your property as long as it's I believe it's less than 40 feet is that is that it is is that where this falls this would be an amendment to that current ordinance that's on the books mr. chair commissioner Gossanker yes we would be amending that section that currently addresses um, trailers designed or used for um, habitable purposes uh, recreational vehicles RVs and yes it does include certain dimensions of for that type of a trailer I believe it's 40 feet in length and there's a certain height limitation also yes uh, we would pr probably propose uh, different um, dimensions for other types of trailers because we you know we don't expect somebody's going to keep a horse trailer on their property that is that large I mean typically those are associated with a, a commercial horse operation and really probably don't belong in residential zones but what we want to do is to uh, provide for the ability to store trailers uh, that would typically be associated with a residential use of the property like a two-horse trailer something like that um, I unfortunately I need to excuse myself I wish to wish everybody a uh, happy holiday season and I know that uh, Victoria is going to come up and address an item uh, and I just want to uh, add my support to it and offer that it can be broken that consideration can be broken into two components ordinances and architectural guidelines so with that we'll see you next year thank you Merry Christmas yep and to your wife to Shelley too that uh, okay I yeah I have another question here um, it says may not be parked or stored in required front or side setback areas that's a change 
Isn't that isn't that a change? I thought you could now that you could have a trailer stored within the setback. Uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Gostanker, the existing regulations do not allow storage within the required setback areas. They do not? They do not. That's correct. Uh, so, for example, you can't, you know, typical setback, residential lot, you could not keep it within 20 feet from the street right of way. You could not keep it within 10 feet from your side property lines. You could, however, park it within your rear yard. That's currently allowed, and we would just continue that, uh, that, that allowance for these types of trailers also. Okay, I'm, I'll, 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 I'm gonna, I'll talk to Diane after the fact. Uh, this is a, it's just a weird, this is weird for me, you know, because we're in a public setting and <laughs> it's personal. I mean, the, the idea is that, especially for side yards, the purpose of a side yard is to provide a buffer area between adjacent properties. It may be less important for large properties than it is for smaller lots, um, such as those that occur in the, uh, the portion of Montecito below the highway. Um, you really don't want to have a 40-foot mobile home parked in your side yard setback that looms up and over the adjacent house and totally uh, overwhelms their, their sense of, uh, yeah, no, of openness. Really, really the of it. Really cool. <laughs> that concludes my presentation, unless there are any further questions. Thank no, thank you. And we'll be seeing this later as it matures. Yep. Ah, oh, I'm sorry, Miss Green. I have a speaker slip for you. Thank you, Victoria Green, on behalf of the Montecito Association. And I wondered, Mr. Chair, would it be okay to ask staff a question before I go ahead with Absolutely. my comments? Okay. Um, I was just wondering, Mr. Langle, <laughs> on the. Um, the adding the provision with respect to conditional use permit and development plan phasing, that's really just to codify what to some degree has been a practice on some of the larger permits. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, members of the commission and public speaker, yes, there has been on occasion um, specific phasing that has been developed and incorporated into the conditions of approval for a particular project based on the large scale uh, scope of that project. We feel it's appropriate to include um, this within the ordinance that provides them the basis for your commission to include such a phasing plan and also provide procedures whereby that phasing plan may be uh, modified later if the need uh, sh should arise. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, um, you know, first I would preface my comments by saying that the Montecito Association hasn't had the opportunity to, to look at these uh, in any depth and I know we'll have that opportunity down the road. So I'll j I'm just giving you some kind of general feedback based on what I see. And I would say that I think for the most part, these move in the right direction. I think some of them, the, the phasing, the indemnification, that's really just a clean up and help, I think help codifying some of these existing practices in the ordinance is appropriate. Um, trailers, number of vehicles on a property, we do, that does come up from time to time in the community. And if uh, numerous vehicles are parked um, outside of setback areas, then there's really nothing that can be done to correct what might be perceived as a bit of a nuisance in a, in a neighborhood. So it seems like these things move in the right direction and we'll be interested to see the specifics on those as they develop. Um, on the temporary use, um, closing that loophole on temporary uses, I think that's, that's um, something that's appropriate and we'll take a close look at that as well. Um, what I did wanna put forward today was um, a request that you add something to this packet of ordinance amendments as it moves forward. And that's something that we came here and talked about, I believe about a year ago. And those, <coughs> excuse me, are some um, ordinance changes to address how building height is determined. So we had some cleanup related to that. Um, and I think also in the, um, in. We also had proposed some minor changes to the Montecito architectural guidelines and development standards that related to basements. Um, and those changes would necessitate, I think, some 
revisions to the land use development code definition section. So we worked this up, presented it to you a while back. I think you were enthusiastic and, and endorsed moving forward with those changes, but um, it got lost in the budgeting issues over the last year. Since you, since I think what staff's proposing here includes changes to the land use development code as well as to the subdivision regulations, chapter 21, that adding on um, perhaps architectural guidelines, but at least the ordinance changes with respect to the height calculation wouldn't be um, putting too much more on staff's plate and hopefully wouldn't result in additional costs. So I have um, provided all of that information to staff in the past and mm -hmm. I, can, I can do that again. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Commissioner. I'm very pleased with, with the work you've done, Mr. Langle. It really, I think it's going to clean up a lot of things and certainly help the county in Montecito. The question I have is, do you think you're going to have the budget funds, even though maybe they've been allocated, to really bring this to a conclusion and, and actually have the ordinances in a, in a format so it gets adopted by the BOS? Mr. Mr. Chair and Commissioner Overall, um, we are hopeful that we will, but uh, a lot of what uh, Mr. Lengel is working on really depends on how things proceed with the Land Use Development Code and the Coastal Commission's adoption process because um, either way we look at it, w whether the Board accepts or rejects the um, suggested mod modifications, we have a lot of work before us and um, this needs to be fit fitted into that. Um, particular effort so we're hopeful but um, and we're proceeding but uh, it could get waylaid depending on how that goes so thanks for asking the question because I think it's a valid one I am Idelson by the way oh I'm sorry <laughs> I, I know you are <laughs> sorry about that <clears throat> and that uh, concludes your presentation if there's no other matters before the commission, we are in adjourn, and I wish everyone a happy holiday and a happy new year. <laughs>